you buy a big collection and in every record in the collection is a seed yeah that goes into other collections and starts new uh obsessions for other collectors so think about that yeah. you buy it buy a 400 or 500 piece collection and all those records go out into other collections it's like a tree uh, dropping its buds onto the ground and then some of those buds grow and, you know So we're here in Ken's inner sanctum. Uh, this is his record room. And uh, he's gonna kind of give us a little bit of a tour and kind of explain to us some of his uh, psychological reasonings for things and, and show us some of the stuff that he thinks is really cool. So uh, uh, let's take a look around. So this old guy walks in my store one day and he had this huge box of records, like nothing was stacked. It was just records just, you know, thrown in there. And I wasn't even going to look through it because there was mold and dust and dirt. And I thought, I don't know, I better at least dig through it. So yeah. I got all the way down to the very bottom. Everything in there was garbage. It was like, Herb Alpert records, just the usual crap you see every day. Yeah. Got to the bottom, and this was sitting on the bottom. Wow. So I bought the entire box just to get this. Tell us about the first time you saw Bill Monroe, or the time you saw Bill Monroe. Um, I think I was about 15, and I had a girlfriend, and uh, her big sister came home one Saturday morning and I was hanging out and she said, you want to go to a bluegrass festival? And I said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, you might like this. So we drove up to Cramden, Wisconsin and uh, parked in the huge parking lot, which was a massive field, like full of, you know, it's basically like a Grateful Dead show, except it was all, uh, bluegrass people and Bill Monroe was playing when we walked in. As you can see, I've been collecting uh, bluegrass stuff for a long time. Uh, all the Tony Rice stuff is in here. I mean, Jimmy Martin. Bill Monroe. So here's the Capitol reissue of one of the oh, coolest bluegrass records of all time. Tragic Songs of Life. The Leuven Brothers. Wow. Some twisted dudes. Yeah. <laughs> so here is the original of that. Wow. So what, what's, what's, what was the first one that you showed me? This is a... That's a newer Capitol okay. reissue. Here's the one that might blow your mind. Original, oh. original version of oh. Appalachian Swing. Oh man, that's got Clarence White on it. That is Woo. Clarence White. Oh man. Right there. And that is the famous Martin Dreadnought that Tony Rice played. So here is the original 12 inch version of that same record. Capital. This is probably one of the best, um, I guess you'd call it Western Swing. Yeah. Right? Records. Just shredding, then, just shredding for days. Here is the other Jimmy Bryant Ooh, record. Oh, yeah. This is a reissue of English reissue 
Here's the original. Also, capital. Have I told you lately that I love you? <laughs> that's a great. That's a great shot. That's a great I know. photo. Yeah. Yeah, but but the thing is, you know, they're all kind of faded out. Like it was a budget label that they sold in Dime Stars and stuff. Yeah. So they have really good cover photos, but they're all kind of faded a little bit. Yeah. You know, which is kind of the cheese factor. I like Rose Maddox mm. a lot. Yeah. yeah, the Maddox brothers. That's one of my all time favorites. Rose Maddox doing kind of bluegrass. It's not real bluegrass. So this is all jazz here. The bottom is actually jazz vocalists. Just an area I'm kind of interested in these days. This is amazing, by the way. Ooh, that's one of the best mono. That maybe is the best mono jazz record of all time. So this is all stuff that I'm either just came in or stuff I'm playing a lot. ECM stuff. Oh yeah, show us some of the, oh yeah. That's good. So I've got just about all the ECM stuff, I think. I love the early verb stuff. Almost all the early verb stuff is great. I also tend to collect a lot of uh, impulse stuff. That's actually a reissue. So don't use that. <laughs> Here's some original impulse and Atlantic coal train. Actually, all of this right here yeah. is coal train with jazz stuff. I do collect a lot of artists that I like, but I also tend to collect labels that I like. Mostly because I know the pressings are going to be good. This is all Larry Coryell. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of his stuff I tend to have, like this, this record I love. It's one of my favorite, maybe my favorite live trio fusion record. So I've got many versions of that. Some of the stuff I've got promo copies. That's an advanced release of Free Spirits. Yeah. Um, a lot of a lot of import import labels. But yeah, this is uh, kind of a serious lifelong obsession that continues. Their cover of the Fairyland. It actually was issued with two covers. Yeah, I believe this is a white label promo. Oh, bad. <laughs> white label advanced release. There are many other obsessions happening here, like the 
John McLaughlin obsession. You know, I've got a lot of his stuff. And actually, I've got, I don't know, 25 or 30 CDs of McLaughlin stuff. A lot of live stuff. Um, Modern Jazz Quartet. I tend to collect almost everything that they've put out, which is an insane amount of stuff. That's on Apple. Apple. Weird. Yeah, the Beatles put off two of theirs. Of course, I won't go to find the other one. But I believe there are at least two. Oh, there's another one that's on the Apple. There's at least two modern jazz quartet records on Apple Records. <laughs> Some gospel stuff, soul stirs, kind of southern gospel. Um, some of this stuff is stuff I've just gotten recently. Can't have too many James Brown records. I'm kind of obsessed with this record lately. Early Rod Stewart stuff with Elton John and Keith Emerson on organ, if you can believe That's that. That's insane. Wow. Ron Wood. Playing uh, slide guitar, uh, Dr. John. Love trombone shorty. Never have too much trombone shorty. Otis Rush live. New John Anderson. Old March Ball on, I believe, Rounder Records. True classic. Everyone needs this. You know him? Mm -hmm. Kind of murky Celtic folk. Hmm. Really good songwriter. And then lately I've been buying a lot of really good reissues. Like that kind of stuff. The Seeds. Good 70s rock thing. Buddy Miles. Well, Buddy Miles. Yeah. And, you know, I have a few soundtracks here and there. This is all New Orleans stuff. Um, one of my favorite new um, labels, Coal Mine Records. They do some amazing stuff. Super uh, premium covers, excellent pressings. If you don't have anything on coal mine, you get, need to check out that label. I do collect a lot of New Orleans stuff. Neville Brothers. Um, Julian Bream. Elliot Fisk. I'm always looking for good classical guitar stuff. Loot recordings. Hmm. Collect a lot of loot stuff. Um, another guy I've really been getting into lately, John Baldry, produced by Rod Stewart and Elton John. Like he's got a thing like both of these records. One side is produced by Rod Stewart, the other side is produced by Elton John. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell when you Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Another great newer coal mine record. Hound Dog Taylor. They're doing all Hound Dog Taylor songs. There's Hound Dog Taylor's hand. What do you notice about that? That's a little bit Did, unusual. Does he have an extra he finger? Has six fingers on both hands. Everybody needs to listen to Hound Dog Taylor. It's raw. It's it's like the most uninhibited blues music, Chicago blues music, probably of all time. I mean, he didn't even have a bass player. He had 
two guitar players, a drummer, and then he was a great singer. See now this is a record that everyone needs. You can buy this for you can buy this in dollar bins. This is one of the best produced rock records produced by Jim Messina. You know, mm -hmm. this guy right here. Yeah. Who was in Poco originally. This is just a phenomenally produced record. There you go. Yeah. Everyone needs that. <laughs> Somewhere over the rainbow. Are you going to do the whole thing? No. Original. That'll be the day. Decca. Yeah, I've got a few of these. These were the original classic records. And I've got a bunch of their test pressings. This is Dave Mason alone together. So this is theoretically the very first off the press. There's not even a label. Wow. <laughs> and classic records, everybody knows that that stuff goes for big money, but real pressing. So I've got test pressing. Yeah. I've got the Who's Next test pressing. Wow. And they all came in a white sleeve like this. No writing. There you go. The definitive soundtrack for all vinyl junkies. Everyone needs this. This is this is like the best soundtrack ever. The Kinks, 13th Floor, Elevators, Velvet Underground, Bob Dylan, The Beta Band, Elvis Costello, Jack Black doing Let's Get It On. <laughs> <laughs> Stereo Lab, Royal Trucks, Stevie Wonder, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. That's an there you go. That's a great movie. That's why I'm as crazy as I am, right there. Yeah. That's if you if track. you want to if you want the key to Ken's madness, you need to watch that movie. Yep. This is the British version. This is the first pressing US on United Artists. And that's the second pressing. Also on United Artists. Here's the original low spark of high heeled boys. Here's the MoFi version. When the ego flies, and here's the UK version of that record, and here are two American versions with different labels. Traffic last exit, two different pressings of that. Traffic on the road. It's a welcome to the canteen. It's a good one. Uh, one with Dave Mason. And then I like traffic. So there's the first US pressing of in the court of the Crimson King. There's the MoFi. That's worth some serious money. Uh, First U.S. pressing. Here's the ones just with yeah. Adrian Blue. There's the newest one at the Orpheum yeah. live with the three drummers. Giles, Giles, and Fripp. Sweet. Red. Um, the Guide. Young Person's Guide, yeah. Oh, That's whoa! So That's a wow. Fripp thing. Lizard. Starless and Bible Black. Yeah. Which I still remember. I had this girlfriend that actually fiance turned girlfriend turned friend. <laughs> that's that <laughs> that's the that's the wrong order. I know. But for <laughs> us it was the right order. So we we're still like the 
best friends. Okay. Right? Yeah. So I was, I didn't know anything about King Crimson. That's how hip this girl was. Yeah. So we went into a record store and she's like, Ken, you got to buy this record. So I bought it and there it is. Yeah. And it got me on the King Crimson journey. Earthbound. So this gets pretty naughty. <laughs> I collect Renaissance stuff. There's a very early Renaissance record. That's that's uh, two different pressings. Another classic Renaissance. Another classic Renaissance. Okay, and then. Before they were called Renaissance, they were called Illusion. Hmm. And they had a different singer. So there's two two Illusion records with Jane Ralph was the vocalist. Keith 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 Ralph's sister. And then Annie Haslam Haslam came in later. Okay, and on this record, they changed the band name to Renaissance. And they called the record. But they illusion. called the record illusion. I or did think. they call the re the record illusion, and they were and, still calling themselves called the, Renaissance? Yeah, the, it's one of the two. Huh. But at some point, yeah, it switched. Some more Renaissance stuff. Later period Renaissance stuff. Two pressings of that. More later period Renaissance. Classic Renaissance. Classic Renaissance. And here's another version of that early record just called Renaissance. Self titled. And then yet another version of Renaissance Illusion. Hmm with a different cover. So they did that a lot. Like here is both American issue novella, one of their classic records, was also issued with this cover. Oh, interesting. It's like a, it's like the same scene, but it's a different yeah. picture of it. Interesting. Yeah. So more Renaissance, more Renaissance. This is more Renaissance than you've ever seen. I, yeah. Right? And then Annie Haslam solo records. Decent everyday people watching, you know, at home watching this video, and they're probably befuddled. They're probably wondering how somebody turns into uh, what you've become here. <laughs> so actually, can you tell actually, us? Actually, I didn't bit? turn into what I've become. I've you've been just, this. You've just been this yeah, way. All right, I've been so, like this since I was like nine. So tell us about some of the experiences that kind of made you realize how uh, how much of a record fanatic you were. Well, I think the thing that a lot of people don't realize the thing that that's really attractive to somebody like me is no matter how many records you collect, there's still going to be billions and billions more. So in a lifetime, you're never going to run out of stuff to obsess about. I mean, there's always more, right? No matter how much you have, there's always lots more. Yeah. And I mean, that's the ultimate sort of, uh, I don't want to call this a hobby, but it's more of a way of life. And you want something that's sort of infinite, right? Right. You, you never run out of stuff to read about and think about and look for. I mean, the journey is 
much bigger than a lifetime could ever accommodate. Would you say you're an audiophile or a record collector or both or something in between? Well, I was trying to find the best version of every record that I like. Mm -hmm. So if I have a mediocre version, I'll keep looking. I'm always upgrading. So in that respect, I might be an audiophile because I want the cleanest, best version of every record. But I don't think I collect stuff because it sounds good. I mean, vinyl obviously sounds good, but I collect stuff that I like. I collect music that moves me, and I guess I'm, I experiment a lot. I mean, I don't buy a lot of really obvious stuff. I mean, I'm always buying stuff that I've never heard, and always experimenting with new genres, and so... I think it's, for me, it's just about, it's about the excitement of discovering something that I've never heard. Yeah. So following up on that, what advice can you give to like up and coming record collectors, people who maybe, you know, have like a little suitcase turntable and they, they're just got a couple of records, but they're like looking at long term that they want it to be kind of like a lifestyle thing. What, what, what well, can you tell them? First and foremost, come to Paramount Record Shop. Because <laughs> you're going to see the most good records yeah. there of uh, pretty much anywhere in southern Wisconsin. But I guess from a philosophical perspective, I would say buy the best equipment you can buy because it's going to preserve your records. Good equipment lasts for a long time. And buy the best records, you know. And if you can't afford to buy the best records, Buy a shitty version of a record you like and keep upgrading, you know, keep trying to find a better one. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, just, just buy stuff you like and, uh, try to do the best you can with whatever money you've got. Every time I buy a record, it's a experience. I mean, every time I'm the, the experience is probably more fun than the actual collecting part. So, you know, sometimes you're on your hands and knees in a basement, you know, digging through stacks of records and you're thinking, is this fun? And for a brief moment, you might say, well, you know, I could be at home on the couch, you know, um, in a cozy, warm house but yeah that's the fun of it yeah it's it's the adventure you know record collecting is an, an adventure you never know what it's going to turn up I yeah mean, you never know where you're going to find this stuff you never know when you're going to find this stuff and in a lot of respects when you go for a streak and you don't find a lot of cool stuff that gets you more fired up to get out there and look I mean, some of the best records I've ever found were, like, in the, the places that you would least expect. Like, I used to drive past this little, uh, kind of junk shop on the way to get to the highway, and I drove past this place for years, and I stopped occasionally and never found any records. Never. It was always the junky, like Olivia Newton-John kind of stuff. So one day I walk in, and in the front of the stack of records is a Wanda Jackson record, Rockin' with Wanda. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I didn't even know that much about her, but I knew it was Rockabilly, and uh, I bought this record for a dollar, and it changed my life. Yeah. Still got it. It's on the wall in there. So it's it's just fun. It's all it's all just about the adventure and the fun of collecting. Don't come home a drinking. <laughs> it says it all. Yeah. Right. 
You should consider a hairdo like that, Grace. Yeah, that would look <laughs> real good. Look. You just sleep standing up. <laughs> <laughs> You're missing the best one. Which one? Black tongues and aspect. I don't have that. I don't think so. Are you sure? I can. Uh, really? What's wrong with you? Well, I've got it on. All right, I've got them all. All on right, the CD. we're. Fun. Stop the documentary. We're coming back once Ken gets his King Crimson collection together.